All right. All right, it's that time again for a new look. <laughs> so um, Shane graciously uh, used his own money and paid, paid for GNULUG.org. So we have our own domain name. So thank, big thanks to Shane. Um, so now our virtual machines that we'll have up online, we'll be able to use a, a DNS name to actually point to them. So um, actually, awesome. about that, like, we, it would be a good an idea. Like, do we want to like use those email addresses? Do we want? And if, oh, so, can do log or email and if so, do we want to throw together our own mail server, or do we want to like have Gmail hosted, which is pretty damn easy to do, and like they I'm have all for easy, right? Like, I think it'd be a fun well, project I, to build a mail server. That that is true, right? So. But like in the meantime, is it worth it while like throwing and like I think it'd even be cool to do. I just found out about this Docker mail, where you can just like pull down like from Git repos like. A set of Docker containers that you know you follow a script and, and it puts together, uh, throws together a, an email server for you like like that. Cool. Yeah, I, I think the, the ideal situation would be to build our own mail server because we all want to get some experience with doing something like that. Um, but that's down the road for sure, I think. But that, but we, you and I were talking about possibly moving this meeting in a direction to where we had dedicated some time to work on some projects during the meeting time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, which would be, that'd be, a, that'd be one cool idea. Like, Hey, let's, we have a server, like, let's put a, let's put a mail server on it. You know, and if anybody else would be interested, we'd also, I don't know if you guys saw, I posted an idea. Is this an appropriate time to just like, no, no, this is good. take over? Okay. No, this is good. Yeah. I, I posted an, I just realized I was just like hijacked the meeting. Um, I posted <laughs> an idea on Facebook. Have you guys, any of you guys seen like this sort of like a JavaScript implementation of a, of a shell window like on a web page? I think that'd be something cool for us to do for, for our landing page. And maybe it could just like be like a little script inside there that taught a few things, like showed how to set, you know, like just, Showed you a few commands and gave you a few prompts, and then at the end, been like, to learn more cool things to do in Linux, visit us at our meetings because we're great and Linux is awesome. Cool. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So maybe then we can, at the end of this meeting, we could divvy up some projects or ideas that we have and then maybe delegate them in the future. Or see yeah, like I'm already future. working on putting together an email server for the CCDC thing. Okay. So if you want, like, I could just kind of learn that for that and then it'll it'll be you know yeah save you time too because you're getting that but yeah so if anybody else wants to look into setting up that javascript thing that would be that'd be a fun project i think devin said he might be willing to to play around with it too but we all like to volunteer people that don't show up to meetings so yeah definitely um in other news our the Zen project system hit the bucket last night, or kicked the bucket. It uh, went down about 1 a.m. Shane noticed it, and there's some. Looks like there might be some uh, ECC errors in the BIOS for the memory, so we need to potentially replace the DIM modules or um, add a, uh, replace the motherboard. So we just haven't had a chance to actually look at it physically yet, but that's what I've what I've heard. So that kind of sucks. Um, in better news, uh, Raspberry PI 2, version 2 is, uh, or Raspberry Pi, sorry, PI, uh -huh. uh, version 2 is now on sale. Um, there was an article on uh, FreeNOS that doing a lot more features with VFS now. I wanted to play with uh, the Zeta file system for some time, especially since I was, used to be a BSD admin, but I haven't got a chance to do it, so something to play with. Um, also, I don't know what, wait, I didn't put most of the documents up here, I don't really know. Um, what the next one is, which is where you look at it. You can now petition the union to fix my document. Wait, let's run around for the police. Oh, just support open document formats when communicating with the public. Oh, that's kind of cool. So you can petition to say, hey, we want this in an open source format. Awesome. Um, so the other thing was the guy that wrote GNU PG, he's going broke. There's an article about that. Uh, well, you basically, there's a bunch of articles about that. But since that happened, there's been like, I think over $50,000 donated to him so he can keep up the, 
his work on privacy. So that How much? Interesting. Huh? How much? I, 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 one of the numbers I read was over 60,000. 60? Yeah. Way more than that now. Yeah, true. Yeah, way more than that now. Yeah. Um, so that was cool. Um, Crunchbag Linux, uh, based off Arch, is now coming to an end. Uh, they got the brothers of Debian. Huh? I think it's Debian based. Oh, it is Debian based? I thought it was Arch. Never mind. Sorry. I'm like, correct. Thank you for correcting There's me. There's an Arch bang. Oh, that's what it is. Damn it. Okay. Yep. Yeah, thank you. So Arch, okay. So yeah. So uh, Crunchbang was a Debian-based distribution that is now com are pretty much done according to the author. The developer has announced the project's come to an end. <coughs> Things get left behind. He doesn't really have time. Or he also says he believes that it has no longer holds any value. So um, he encourages everybody to use vanilla Debian. There's a really cool article out on the security related, but on um, LD preload, a variable environment variable you can set to actually load a live. Go ahead. Just something related to what you just said. I, th I think it's kind of funny. I just saw a video online of uh, a talk that Lin Linus Torvalds gave that he has never used any Debian based distro whatsoever. Oh, really? He said, <laughs> he said they're, they're too difficult to install. <laughs> <laughs> Is it really? Yes. That's interesting. I wonder why you think that. So yeah, this is about LD preload. It's uh, the ability to use a library uh, prior to loading other libraries in the system. You'll find a lot of uh, uh, our user land rootkits will exploit that by saying if you have to call uh, the system call open for some something in your program, if you do LD preload, you load your own library that actually has so that, that call in there, you write your own function for it, and it will do what you want rather than what the system will want or what the system will do. And it gives you a detail on how to do detection. Here's a little C program where they actually uh, they open up the preloading uh, C file or a library file, and they're able to check whether it's um, or whether that successful open was uh, an indication of whether uh, your system supports it. And then further on, they got, there's a lot of code in this. But actually detecting whether a variable is set, et cetera, et cetera. It's really, it's really interesting. So I um, highly recommend this. Really good article, detailed. Um, yeah, lots of stuff on here in the proc file system as well. Getting the memory address space for the library, et cetera. So I highly recommend that if you're interested in it. The other thing was on the Cypherpunks mailing list. If you're interested in privacy, I highly recommend joining the Cypherpunks. It's a lot of guys that just uh, shoot the shit and talk about privacy, and they're, and they're pretty pretty effing adamant about privacy and about mailing lists. And every once in a while, there's something new that comes out. There's a, this uh, mail program called Confidant Mail is an open source, non SMTP cryptographic email system optimized for large file attachments. So it's its own, has its own protocol, client server architecture, and it's used as a new privacy guard for the actual encryption and authentication. And you can actually use it over uh, Tor. So if you're interested in the Take a look at the features you can right there, and you can and use it to contact whoever else you want to contact using this this program, this actual pro this uh, protocol uh, geared toward privacy. Um, and there's there are packages for OS 10 and uh, Linux, etc. Um, so uh, education epochs, this epoch is where we talk about any training courses or related to Linux that are worth looking into. The Linux Foundation actually has a sale now for their Essential system administration, a standalone is uh, $399. Uh, Wayland actually just purchased this, and uh, I went through the, the contents of uh, on the website here. And uh, if you look at it, there's, it's, it's, there's quite a bit of detail here. A um, few things that stood out that I don't see in a lot of other uh, courses is that it covers all three popular unit systems. Uh, kernel modules, UDEV, there's a whole section on UDEV, which is pretty cool. Um, the other thing is it covers uh, Linux file systems, including XFS and VTRFS, which are you know, up and coming big things that you don't hear a lot about. Also, logical volume management and a number of other things, package management systems, and modules. So it looks fairly pretty in depth compared to a lot of the stuff I've seen. So, for 400 bucks, you know, if it's near a bit in budget and you can afford it, I'd highly recommend purchasing it straight from the Putlet Fund uh, minus the salary. And other things. So nothing from proc period. Um, SSH section. So um, Wayland added these. Uh, the first one is self-explanatory. The PID file you can actually change that if you wanted to be in a different location. Um, 
The debugging in the SSH client also, sure, uh, the more Vs you put, the more verbose it is. Let's do, um, oh wait, where's my, So we can just apply this. If you've, ever, if you've never used this, so I'm going to go to some login to my mail server or my web server. All right, nothing exciting. So now we're going to add dash v, and you get a lot more exciting things, such as uh, different debugging levels. This is level one right now. You can tell me what it's doing. It's uh, anything that's also uh, it's going to tell you the environment variables that are set for, that are passed up. It tells you where where it tried what line for particular options when it read your SSH config file. The, uh, the information was sent, the ciphers, the algorithms, back and forth, let you know all that information. And since I'm using the master control to, to multiplex different communications, it actually tells you that here. Using the, I'm using the CM socket directory for this. And of course, you can go one further. Now you can see that there's uh, debug two uh, values in here. Uh, so it's more uh, verbose output. And then finally, um, you can do uh, three. And you can see that there is now debug level three information. So, so this is really helpful. I can tell you a few examples of being a sysadmin. When you're in setting up an SSH server and you can't get in, and you want to know what, like if you have a different authentication type with, uh, uh, other than password, like public keys or GWS API and or Kerberos and RSA tokens, and you might not know which one it's trying, and uh, you can use the dash V option that tells you which one, which authentication type it tried in order, so you can see, in some cases, you may forget to turn the flag on inside the SSH daemon, and you'll see that's why it failed on this one. So that's, it can actually tell you which one's, which one's it's trying, and then whether they exceed or not, succeed or not. So that is a, a quick way to debug um, whether you have correctly set up your SSH daemon. So. And this one, use DNS, we go to the man page. This is a security feature. Dun, 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 dun. Use DNS. So, specifies whether uh, SHD should look up the remote host name and check. So, um, if they map back and forth, it'll allow it. If not, it will not allow it. So, it's a security feature for people that are spoofing things. They, their, their res the resolution does not match back. So, um, essentially, what that is, so it's highly recommended for production systems or systems that you care about that should be having legitimate users that have a, a, res, a reverse uh, lookup and a forward lookup. So. Next, uh, shell space. So we have um, redirection and pseudo. So this is essentially what we talked about when Simon was here and about why it did not work, which I said incorrectly, um, alluding to shell built-ins. But the reason why those commands didn't work when you echo pseudo echo something into the file is that after the pseudo command execute is when the redirection takes place. And just to make that more clear, which I should have just demoed it right there, but I didn't even think about it, um, is to do, I shouldn't have closed that window. But, so, pseudo, all right, and we're going to echo something. And we're going to put it in Etsy password. Permission denied. And what's actually happening is here is denying because, like I said, the pseudo command executed echo something. But one, once that was done, the redirection happens post execution. And then um, it fails to rewrite it because you no longer have the privileges of pseudo. You have the privileges of your normal user now. So, how do you fix this? Well, the, the way that's recommended is to do something like this. Where you call the shell, you say the shell execute a particular command so that the entire pipeline here is executed as the pseudo or pseudo user. So you do that, and now once I authenticate, well, that should be end up in my SC password file. So um, system. Okay. So now if we actually go to SC password, you can see something at the very bottom. Remove it. Oh yeah, and I'm not uh, root, so let's. Do we have um, by pseudo or uh, pseudo edit on here? No, we do not. So pseudo vim and c password. Okay. All right. So 
fairly easy to understand, just to demonstrate that. Um, sorry. And then, so that takes care of uh, shell space. Now, of in vicinity, did you have anything for that? Yeah. Okay, cool. I figured these are your notes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let me get you back to the terminal here. I don't know where you want to do it. Uh, Uh, it, never mind. Oh, back to this. Uh, I just forgot this one. No. You have to do a dash dash no dash check dash certificate. Oh, okay. How'd you class them like that? Uh, those are the phones. I'll demonstrate that in another thing Damn. if you want. Or I can just, I can talk about it real quick if you want. Yeah, go for it. Uh, so, Vim has a feature called folding, which is uh, something you find a lot of uh, other like full featured IDs like Eclipse or whatever. And uh, basically, you can collapse uh, a section of lines onto a single line just for uh, readability if you're working on a big project or something or doing a presentation. Uh, so, I don't really know too much about it other than um, the basics, which are to create a fold, you um, you highlight the region with uh, visual mode, then you press ZF, and that creates a fold. And uh, once you create the fold, you can use you can highlight the fold with the cursor and press ZO, that opens it, and then ZC closes it, and ZD deletes it. That's all I know. But uh, ZC closes it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So, okay. And then let me do. Okay. So, uh, first thing I'm going to talk about visual block mode. And uh, so this is, a, this is an extension on the normal visual mode uh, that you all are used to, I'm sure. Uh, so, to access visual block mode, you press Control B. And uh, so now it sits visual block down in the mode line. And uh, what this basically is is a rectangular uh, visual mode. So you can select a block of text to uh, work with. So um, one thing I find this really useful for is uh, inserting text on multiple lines. Uh, this is not the only way to do this, but it's by far the easiest, and I use it all the time. So uh, I'm just going through that real quick. So let's say we wanted to. Um, to put some text on all five of these lines uh, all at one time. So what I'm going to do is I'm enter visual block mode, uh, select just this first column here, and then I press capital I, and uh, that enters insert mode, but acting upon the block that you just selected. So you can enter some text, and when you press escape, it will actually uh, fill that all in on each line. So uh, now for a little bit more of a practical example. Um, this is great for comments, by the way. Yeah. So let's see. Let's pull that up there. Uh, so let's see. Uh, like let's say we, this was part of a uh, these four lines were part of a program, and you wanted to uh, print them out um, each with separate print statements. Uh, you could do that with visual block mode. Uh, in just the same manner, as you can see, they're all uh, they all have printf open paren quote, and then uh, we want to add the the part at the end of the line too. And this is a little more involved, so you do you can actually start anywhere on the line. You enter visual block mode, you select all the lines, and you press the dollar sign to go to the end of the line. And uh, what that does is it, it'll actually select up to the end of the line of each line specifically. Uh, and then you press capital A, and that will append uh, to each line. And then you can fill in your, uh, 
whatever you want to append each line. And that's a quick way to do something like that. Um, and of course, it works with uh, repeat operators as well. So uh, next thing, uh, joining lines. Uh, so let's say you're working on a program here, and uh, someone worked on it for you, and you don't like their uh, their syntax style, them putting uh, putting these things on separate lines. So uh, you can actually join lines. You can actually join the current line with the line below it by pressing uh, capital J, and it will convert the new line character into a space. Uh, so you saw it here. I'm at the end of the line here, and it turned that into a space, and it brought the contents of the next line and uh, combined it with the current line. And you can do that repeatedly. No, course. don't do that. So uh, that's, a, that's a quick way to do something like that. Uh, you might think that uh, capital K would do the inverse, but I guess they were thinking you could just uh, go to the go up a line and then uh, join downward. But uh, I actually added this to my MRC at home um, to be able to do that feature because normally capital K is mapped to go to the man page of the selected word. It's like if you've had uh, less or something, you press capital K, it goes to the man page. Uh, but I don't really use that that much, so. Uh, what I did is I actually did a map um, of capital K to the um, is it the fold or not the fold uh, join, and then you have to specify a negative one parameter just to uh, to specify that you want the line above it, and then insert a carriage return. And so now, if you wanted to join, we're going to do that so we get unhappy. If you wanted to join uh, these two lines, but starting on this line, press cap OK, and it does the same thing. So that's pretty nifty. Um, related to this would be separating lines. Uh, let's say you have a very long line here, and you can see this is uh, looks like uh, 929 uh, characters wide. I'm not sure if that's right. Uh, yeah. And uh, let's say you wanted to split this up into multiple lines to make it uh, more readable on uh, different systems with different uh, different uh, terminal widths and such. Uh, so the standard, the classic standard uh, terminal window at least is 80 columns by 24 lines. Uh, so that's what them defaults to uh, when you use this uh, next feature. Uh, so basically, I can do a visual line selection on this, or I guess I could just do plain visual as well, it's the same thing. And then uh, to separate this into multiple lines, to split it up, you press GQ, and that will format it automatically. And I'm not sure if there's a way to change the width. I'm guessing that there would be, but uh, the standard is to split it up 80 lines, and then uh, you know it'll it'll do it nicely, so it won't split up words across lines. I wonder if you can just do like uh, colon text width equals. I think that's what it is. Oh yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, looks like it. So whatever your text width is, then that that works. And what was the, the command you used? G what? Uh, GQ. GQ. Cool. Yep. And uh, that also works with the standard uh, Vim motions as well. So if you don't want to, uh, if you have like, say, five of these or something, you could do G, or you could probably do GQ 5J. Yeah, looks like it. Cool. Yep. Sweet. The folds are pretty. Folds are really nice. The visual block stuff. I've been doing that for a little bit now. That's yeah. really useful, especially when you do comments. Yeah. Your code. It always annoys me when I uh, I work on a computer that doesn't have the full version of Vim installed, and it's like Vim dot tiny, and it because oh. it doesn't have visual block, so I can't really see that. Sucks. <laughs> yep. Cool. Thank you. Yep. All right, no C quarter tonight, unless anybody wants to step up. Uh, all right, so let's put it in MAP. Our MAP is a, is a really uh, sweet program that has a million
between the land options. Actually, it's not a million, but I think it's, been a, it's over a thousand um, with all the arguments too. Um, so it is a network mapper, essentially what MMAP stands for, and it allows you to do things like uh, host discovery and service discovery. And it goes even further to do OS detection, and it has this own, its own scripting language based, well, it's not its own, but it uses Lua for scripting. People can write plugins, and then you can actually use those in your environments to do particular interesting things. Uh, for example, one of the things you can do is you can check SH, SH versions, the banners. You can do um, find old V1 versions. You can use SMB scripts. There's a bunch of S, SMB scripts by uh, Ron Bose, I think. Yeah, Ron Bose. Uh, he wrote, uh, where's a Gula? Damn it, I don't even remember now. I'm going to look it up. Sorry. It's uh, SMB and map scripts, Ron. Appeal? Yeah, it's Ramos. Okay, he wrote a bunch of these. Like this one checks for uh, vulnerabilities in SMB, and you can do stuff like mapping shares, getting the information from the share, permission, all that stuff. Really interesting. But it's most fundamental. It's a networking tool, and um, as an administrator, I've used Nmap uh, defensively and offensively, and is a great way to map your host. So I highly recommend when you bring up production systems to scan with Nmap from the outside. To see what's available, what other people can actually access for access to access to the resources, because you can see what ports are open. And if the ports are open, there's no intermediate device blocking access to those ports. Then people can query them and try to get information from them or connect to them and do something like it's an SSH, right? So um, quick, quickly started. There's a number of options. Um, first thing is, and that by itself, um, we can do nmap google.com. I should probably you can just press the space. It actually gives you some information here. 39% uh, of the scan done, and this actually tells you what Google.com has available. You can see that they have TCP MUX, HTTP management, HTTPS, and a bunch of this some X11 stuff that resolves this particular host that Google.com is pointing to at the time. Um, so I've got a bunch of things right there that's really interesting. So let's just do uh, a little further. So what actually happens here is. Uh, there's different, there are different scan types. Dash lowercase s is a scan type, and the and or the specify the option that you want to do a particular scan. The capital S after says what kind of scan. In this particular case, we're actually using a stealth scan. What's actually going to happen is your machine is going to send a TCP a connection out with, with beginning with actually it's not even going to be complete the connection. It's going to be a, a TCP segment with the with the SYN bits that were synchronized with the host. And if the host responds with an ACK, an acknowledgement. That means to, that all, that's all that needs to be there to tell Nmap that this port is open. Um, then, uh, for a full TCP handshake, what actually happens is a SYN, a SYN ACK, and then the final ACK. And that, that's called a three-way handshake in TCP. That says that this is going to be a connection you complete. And what actually happened with the SYN and the ACK is you're at, what you're doing is you're actually synchronizing uh, sequence numbers. That's what you're doing. When the first thing comes out, you set the sequence number. When the app comes back, you set the sequence number from the other side, and that's how they know where to begin counting the bytes across the network connection. So, um, did you have a question, Shane? No, I just was able to get it to work as soon as I made sure I was connected to the internet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, um, so if we want to do the full handshake, we do dash T for TCP. And they call it uh, spin stealth because um, Typically, uh, your your daemons will not log um, if it's only if the handshake is not complete. There won't be a log generated for connection complete in your in your logs, say SHD or something else. It's called a, SIN, a stealth scan. There's a number of other ones like ACK scans and pushes and window scans and other things and null scans. Just modifying different bits of the TCP segments to see how a particular host responds. But typically, almost all all you really need is the the, the TCP uh, SYN scan or the TCP regular scan. Um, the, and the ACK scan is, is useful in stateful or stateless firewalls um, because you'll get uh, if the firewall is stateful and you send a, an ACK to say, hey, I already communicated with this host and he had an acknowledgement with it, then the firewall, if it's stateful, it won't respond. But if it's stateless, it could respond. So that's how one way to tell the difference between stateless and stable firewalls. Um, there's a few other ones that are mostly in weird scenarios where you want to scan odd devices with weird TCP IP stacks and might be able to get information from them. But anyway, so we can do dash T if you want to do the full scan. And let's actually look at the packets as they come through. So dash S, we'll, we'll go ahead and do, we'll scan for this one port. We'll do dash P80, or I'm sorry, uh, let's, yeah, let's do 80. 
and we'll use John Chip.com on my website as an example. And then what we can do is we'll see the result here. Or for the SIN scan, I forgot to mention. Oh, that was weird. Okay. For the SIN scan, we actually have you need to have um, root per permissions. Uh, for the TCP scan, you do not. So we can see that that port is open on my website right there. And if I go to my website, you're there because that's the ports communicating across with. So in this particular case, let's add another option, dash dash packet dash trace. And this actually shows you the packets that were sent across while NMAP scan. So this is a great option for learning how to use NMAP. And in this particular case, you can see that my machine, this laptop, before it even did the send scan, NMAP tries to do host discovery to determine whether the host is online because if it can't get a response with the ping, for example, ICMP echo, it'll actually just not even worry about it. It'll actually just say, hey, this host is online, why bother scanning it? Unless you tell it to explicitly scan it. So what it first does is send an ICMP echo request right here to johnship.com. Then you can find out that johnship.com responds back. Oh, wait, did it? E is actually out of order. Hold on. TCP echo request. Yeah, and then it went ahead and did the SIN scan. I don't know why I didn't see the response back. Maybe there was no response back and went ahead and did it. But you'll actually, what else will happen is that in host discovery, NMAP doesn't only rely on the echo request, it's the timestamp request. Ah, that's what happened. So my machine or the host did not respond. Let's just double check that though. So this is what it's resolved to. So do to dig uh, johnship.com, shorts. Yes, it's that. So ping. Uh, okay, so it did get it should got the response, but I don't know why we didn't actually see the output of this. So um, unless it was delayed, but we can actually see that we have, we did get the, re the timestamp response, right? Here it is. So we sent the, the timestamp request and the response. This is just to get the timestamp of the server. And a lot of a lot of people about ICMP because it's important to the internet. It's crucial for sending messages whenever things are broken. Um, very, it's an information protocol. So, so in that particular case. Could a real TCP wizard do all this without MMAP? Yeah, yeah, you can grab it from the command line, yep. Yeah. Like with Scapey, for example, it changes off on open in a sim. Um, so, um, yeah, so in this particular case, we, we actually, there's the sin here. This is, we, we synchronize with the server with the sin bit right here. They send an act bat, an act bit back, which is we acknowledge your sin bit, and then that was it. At that particular point, MMAP says, that's really enough. You can see here, Here's the rest of it, the SYN, SYNAC again, and the SYNAC is what we wanted to see when we got back, because we're both set, because he's actually synchronizing the initial SYN that I sent to him, and he's acknowledging it, the one that I sent. So, um, so they're building both sides. In that particular case, that allows us to say, hey, the port was open. Once it receives this, that is the sole determiner for whether the port is open or not. If the port is closed, um, let's try something, uh, this is, this is probably a port that's not open. Okay, so what happens now? In this particular case, um, ah, so I, okay, I know what that was before. I'm sorry, I'm not even, I didn't look in further detail. What actually happens is NMAP does not only do the ICMP echo to see if the host is up, it does a port, a check to port 443 and the port 80, which we did not specify just to see if there's a response from the server to see that it's up. That's part of the host discovery phase, not the actual scanning phase. And once it determines that the port is up, it then actually does this right here, which is the, the, syn the synchronization and the synchronization acknowledgement back from the server. So in this particular case, we did it to a strange port, and first NAP is trying to determine whether the host is up again by waiting for a response from it. And again, echo request, send to port 443, acknowledgement to 80, Timestamp request, we got a response, timestamp reply, and then we actually send out the packet because it found that the host is up. And then it decided to send out the packet to 234. And in this particular case, oh, and you see that the echo reply here? This echo reply came late. It matches the echo request up here. Okay. Um, so that came, that came late, so I didn't see it right away. And what happened here is we did a send to that. And we didn't get any response. You don't see a SYN hack. And look at here. You actually see the same thing again. The SYN to the same system, 67252056725 on the same port, because it tried one more time in case it got, the packet got lost. And then that, because there is no response back from the server, and map labeled it as filtered. There's one filtered right there. 
So, so that actually filter is a state which does not allow you to know whether it is actually closed or not. It could be open. All that tells you is that they, they, no response from the server. So what that actually means is there could be a firewall in between your sending machine and the server, and the firewall is actually blocking, but the port really is open on the other side. To actually know whether the port is closed, what actually happens in the TCP communication is a TCP reset. So a TCP um, segment with the reset bit set. If you get that back, that says that the host is responds to with that when the port is closed. And what we can do is um, let's do here. Let's, let's uh, what's the option for um, give me a second here. I don't use the as much as I used to using all a lot of this stuff without my head. Uh, we want the option actually shows you tells you the oh, reason this dash dash reason. So this actually tells you why. So in this case, dash dash reason, which is another option you should use if you're an MAP newbie. It tells you why. Or you can use it all the time. So it said this tells you why it was filtered because there was no response, right? And if we do that again and we do on port 80, you can see the reason was that it received this in ACK. So it's, instead of going through the, the debugging of the packet send, you can actually just look at the reason right there and it tells you what was determined based off of that. Um, so a port that might be closed, or um, 53 maybe? Uh, domain, oh, that's filtered too. Let's scan a bunch. So another thing to do is by default, NMAP will scan a large number of ports. I think it's the top 1,000 based on uh, the data of what is the most common port seen on the internet. So it actually has that in a database. And so let's talk about the most common, which is probably HTTP web, something like that, right? And it works its way down to the top 1,000. Fast scan does the top 100, I believe. So you use fast scanner here. We need to, uh, oh yeah, we can't specify the port with the fast scan top 100. It's going to send a bunch of crap out. And you can see that based on the fast scan and the reasons, my website has FTP open, SSH, SMTP, HTTP, and whatever the hell it's in. It is. is. Um, NMAP actually gets these names from its own services database, and it also has an OS database. Then we actually get OS information from the system. So if you want to do that, we can go a little further, and we can do uh, version detection. And so let's go back here. John? Yes. Like Pat, when Packet Trace returns those, um, when, when it says what the protocols are of the ports that are open, it's doing those by industry standard, right, and not by any sort of evidence that that's actually the service that's running on that port. No, and that's a little different. And that actually has its own services file based. It's a bunch of aggregated databases by all the people that use NMAP to figure it out. Right, right. So, so somebody else could be running some funky custom protocol. Oh, on I see. What you're right. And like the fact that it says it's, it's SSH doesn't really mean that. It's right. Necessarily. Yeah, and to, to to go farther and change point is that you need to then go to the next step and do some sort of a banner grabbing or enumeration of the actual service. And NMAP has it called version gathering, and you, dash, you pass the dash S, or the, the V option to do that. So we'll do it for these two ports here. We don't need too much. And um, what it's going to do, and that has a database to say, for different ports and services, what is the most likely, what can we send to it to get the most likely, or to most likely have a response to get information from it? So it's going to keep sending these out until it has enough information collected. And I should have probably turned off the packet trace on this, because this there's a lot of information. But, um, It's going pretty close. You can adjust all these timeouts. So the cool thing about MMAP is if you're an attacker or just someone who likes to play around the internet, you can just scan all kinds of hosts. It's a random option. You can scan. If you want to find all port, like you're interested in some service, say you're interested in uh, machines on the internet that have X11 exposed, right? Remote X11 on 6000, for example, you can use NMAP to scan a huge number of range of those addresses and get all the results back, and then you can start querying their systems if you wanted to. Wait, what does remote X11 mean? Uh, that's the port that you can use to actually query the X server. So you can actually uh, you push uh, the desk, the, whatever's on their desktop, you have X to, to your machine. For right, right, yeah. But you, huh? So is that the port that's used when you connect like SSH-Y or whatever? Uh, yeah, well, kind of. So SSH-X uh, does um, I think it starts with 6,010, and then for every one, it increments it by one. Uh, thanks for coming, Kyle. Yes, yes. It increments it by one, and um, 
So yeah, your mesh load down port will be open on local hosts on that system because it then forwards from local hosts over the SSH uh, connection. And you can do wildcard strike addresses. So if you're doing yeah. local network, you can do just 192.168.star or something like yeah, that. And so you can so. scan the entire net. Yeah, it's good. Especially when you want to figure out what students are having, like win a Windows file share is open and stuff. <laughs> Don't recommend it though. But uh. <laughs> <laughs> so what do we get here? So at this particular point, it said, yeah, if this one's open, HTTPS was filtered, no response, and it was not able to detect the version. It, so this gave us a signature of all the crap it tried. If you know what it is because you own the service, you can go to the website and enter the fingerprint and tell them what it is so they can add it to the database. But I was not, based on this, I was not able to figure out what that was. Um, so uh, what else we can do is OS detection. Let's just go to MF here, OS. Uh, A's for aggressive, you can do timing stuff. I can tell you um, based on timing intervals, a lot of systems like our black hole router, the NCSA, you can actually bypass the, the, the black holing of your system if you use something like dash T2, because based on the timing, it only, it only counts, keeps track of certain uh, connections when you're support scanning for a per particular point of time, because otherwise it takes a lot of memory, it has to do space over time. So if you can actually set your scan up to only scan D, slow like that, so like, shh, you know what I mean, a bunch of packets, uh, you won't keep state of all that, and by the time it's, it runs out of memory based on the interval of the software, it won't be counted as, a, as an actual port scan, for example. And a lot of software's like that. I was able to bypass a Sonic wall uh, firewall before an older business because well, they, their system did that too. Well, plus, I think that'll help to obscure what you're doing from somebody that's just like wire sharking the, the packet like the, the actual traffic, if, if 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 you see like ports, like all these ports hit like right in a row, it's like, oh, I'm, I got, I'm getting port scanned, but if there's a bunch of other stuff in between, it's like, it's a lot harder to read something like that, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, just to go a little further, uh, like I said, the dash V pros open ports, you can actually get all kinds of options to try how much intensity. You can actually run the scripts here. The OS detection is enabled with dash O, so we want to do that on this host. Uh, we'll do dash O, see if we can actually get some information from it, and go. Actually, I don't want packet trace, that's too much info, so let's just get rid of that. O. Is this a physical server or like a VPN? This is, this is a, this is a VM on DreamHost, and so, I, with, I mean, it's, there's, it's a VM on a physical server, I expect. I don't actually know. I've, I've never touched it, besides logging into it, but, um, yeah, I wish I had some better ones to scan. While that's running, you can also do uh, back to the host discovery stuff. It's really nice to be able to do ARP lookups on your network. You don't even have to ping them. You can just send a bunch of ARP requests out to all the addresses and see what the responses are at the layer two level. Um, so here, we found a bunch of stuff open on that particular system. Uh, this, a lot of this could be a lot of other hosts on there too. But it says the OS scan results may be unreliable because they have the criteria here. They didn't, they didn't find one uh, closed port, it looks like. But the device, they categorized it as a Linksys device, uh, wireless access point that I'm actually touching. Kernel 2.4. Uh, uh, tomato. So that could be accurate or not. Um, so that's, that's definitely really interesting. Uh, but let's do just some more fun stuff. Uh, let's do the, the version of the host discovery. So um, ping scan is what we want. So it doesn't disable the port scan and just allows us to ping on the Postman network. So let's just do this real quick. So EN0 is at this address. So what I want to do is nmap. I want to do this. And then dash dash reason that works for this too. And we can do uh, 128.174.22.star. All right. At this point, it tells us all the hosts that it found. Mm -hmm. So this host is up. All these hosts are up. Um, so you can actually pass another option called dash dash open, which only responds with what's available and omits everything that is not, which is going to give the same thing. So everything that's prefixed with host is up. Um, so you can see all these machines are up, and we could Hello? scan it, I suppose. I don't know what if I'm allowed to do this, to be honest. But oh, I think I um, so at this, at this point, let's take a look at who this guy is. So we're going to go fast scan again. I'm Reason. in the meeting still. And SSH is open. Let's let's query it a little bit more. Let's do the version detection on this. Actually, let's do yeah um, version detection. Aha, we got actually got information this time. It said that it's running OpenSSH 5.9 patch one on Ubuntu Linux. So 
So you go to identify. What, what did you do to get that info? Huh? And map dash FS. Uh, so S is the fast scan, the top 104. This is what I recommend if you're going to do anything because it gives you the, the quickest results. And then the, the B of this one is dash SV for version detection. We can do dash O now. Do the OS detection. Oops. Remember, if you don't if you don't have a real box, you can do the dash S capital T to do the TCB scan, which is not required or privileged. Because you have to open up a raw socket otherwise with the self scan just to do half the connection. Otherwise, the operating system takes care of it with the connect system call or whatever. Um, so in this case, it detected the system was Linux. Uh, didn't really give us much else though. So based on the results of above though. What we can do is, eh, well, let's do, let's just grab another host, do the random one. CSL, let's do U, press spacebar to see the results here, if it has them ready yet. No. I wonder if I, um, I, have, I wonder if there's some block on this. But I don't know if it's. Uh, I don't want to change so long. Go ahead and quit out of it. But anyways, if you get you get the idea. Other things that are really nice is the uh, dash. Um, SL option. So you can actually have a give a big text file with IP addresses that actually go through and scan them all. So you can just pass them the list. Um, you can do specific options in host discovery, like excluding particular hosts. Um, there is uh, a nice with the random targets. You can say, hey, I want to scan 1,000 random hosts, and it actually gets just generates IP addresses. Do you have a question, Shane? No. Okay, I don't know if your hand went up or not. Sorry. Um, you can also do um, trace routes, a um, bunch of other stuff. Um, if you're interested in more advanced things like uh, FTP bouncing, it's an attack on FTP servers using the port command that allows you to, if they're vulnerable, if the system is vulnerable, you can actually launch attack as an FTP server, server that's vulnerable. And it, the LMS scan actually looks like it coming from the FTP server instead of you. The other one is the idle scan that's actually available in this too, the dash I. You get a zombie host, one whose TCP sequences um, is it T? I can't even remember now. I think it might be IP. Um, the sequence numbers that are generated incrementally, that means they're guessable. So you, you ping a machine enough times to figure out whether the algorithm is, is, uh, is, is randomized or incrementally. And the older TCBI stacks and operating systems that, are, that don't have a lot of security in mind will generate incrementally. And then from that, you can, you can predict after every, every time you send a packet what the new number will be because it's going to increment by one. And in that particular case, you can use that to have that to actually get results from another machine by spoofing back to that machine. And when that machine, if it, so you act like you're another host, you say, hey, I'm Google.com's IP. And then you send out the packets to Google.com IP with your source address spoofed as the zombie host. The zombie host is the one that has their vulnerability in the TCP IP stack where it increments incrementally. And every time it gets back to that host, it's incremented as one when the packet, when it responds back. So then you just query that host for its IP ID. And then whether it jumps one or two, it actually tells you whether the responded, the SYNAC came back from that other host and whether the ports are actually open on the host that you wanted to scan from the victim. It's kind of complicated, but I've done it before and it works. <laughs> Uh, the problem is a lot of a lot of modern operating systems have that um, vulnerability uh, have that have that mitigated with randomization of TCP IP, or, uh, IP IDs. Um, and there's a few other ones, but uh, you can do top ports. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, um, that might have been the one I was thinking of. Yeah, you can do 10 or 20 like top most frequently yeah. used ports, or is it the mo like is it the uh, 10 highest traffic ports on that? It's server. the most ports that have been the most likely to be seen. Okay, so it's like the statistic it's, it's average the across high traffic. Yeah, what is most seen across? But yeah, so that's super helpful. Like, because 
if you really want, just want to know if you have FTP port or SSH port or something open on this, you don't want to wait while it scans 64,000 ports, right? You're just like, no, just hit the 10, you know I want. Right. And instead of using that, I always, uh, which I have used that before too, but the dash F I talk about with the fast scan is, is great too for that uh, kind of thing. We just want to do the top number. Um, and then the scripting, the scripting stuff too. Uh, so I can go on. And then you have the whole firewall IDS evasion where you can spoof your source address. Yeah, we could have a net. We could have decoys, uh, et cetera. So. so I have to run to the lab. Thanks a lot. Yeah. We could have a we could have an NMAP we, group. Year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> NMAP club. That's pretty cool. <laughs> The, it's just so versatile. I do want to learn some more about uh, some basic networking. I think you recommended TCP IP Illustrated. Yeah, it's a really good one. Yeah, me too. I don't, I don't know if I, I don't Hold on, real quick before you guys go. I want to sometime, you know? Yeah. I want to show you something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I wrote this article a while back. I did this at a foreign business. So we use NMAP, you install NMAP, it comes with a program called NDIF. And what we did was we did daily scans. And uh, so every day we did an NMAP scan and then got the results of all those systems on our, our all systems on our network. And the next day we did a diff of the next scan. It actually shows you what ports changed. So you can see if that's where you can detect compromised hosts too. If a port, a newly opened port on some strange numbers, you know, just opened up and it wasn't in the yesterday scan. Either someone installed a new service, it was compromised, or something weird going on with the OS. You know what I mean? And then so you can do that. So here's what I'm, I wrote an article on how to do it, but it's some shell scripting. But then it would send me email to use the version information. Like I can get yesterday, like this machine, it actually told me um, when the SSH keys changed for my hosts, because MF version detection gets the fingerprints wow. and stuff like that. And I, just all automated using shell. And they give you, because you can export your NMAP output to grabable format. XML and stuff, then you can change the XML, XML to HTML using an XML to HTML tool, for example. And then I generate a web page for every single day. Um, so then I have like a web page that shows all the hosts with each port open every single day. So. Wow. But, all right. Hey, thanks a lot. Yep. See you guys next week. All right, thanks for coming out. Yeah, thanks. Yep. It's nice because then you can just store the diffs, right? So that saves you a lot of, a lot of room. Yep. Oh, yeah, wait, one thing. Uh, if, if anyone has um, like any uh, awk or regex knowledge, that would be cool for a, a thing. I can do awk. Um, well, I can do regex reg reg too. Yeah, like what kind of regex? Yeah, how this? Just, I don't know, like anything cool that you, I don't know. I only know like basics. Yeah. All right, that concludes the log. Thank you. Basics are good. <laughs>